KG, I sort of wanted to just quickly narrow the conversation to a personal experience that I uh, experienced in Fiji before going into the broader situation of LGBT people in my country, but also uh, specifically picking two countries in the Pacific, the president in the group, Vanuatu, on a certain human rights situation and the backlash they face, including on a recent meeting that we had in Tonga, the first Pacific LGBT. Is this annoying? It's irritating. Yeah. A recent experience that we had in the Kingdom of Tonga where we convened as LGBT activists in the region for our first uh, human rights conference. The, um, the passion that I have for this work, for this uh, the activism and also in terms of solidarity movement building within my Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Definitely. Much so um, I came into the movement because of the situation that I faced in high school when I was 16 years old. I was brutally assaulted by six men and um, in 2002 I took them to court. I filed a complaint with the Fiji Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission. So they represented me in Fiji's court, it went through the magistrate. When I was 16 years old, through that one whole year of just going through the case, we finally, uh, um, on the 10th of June 2003, these boys, these men, were found guilty and they were sentenced to six months community service, uh, as well as anger management. Because they were first offenders, they, were, you know, they could not uh, go to jail and they were also minors. So within that one year, I was dealing with a lot of backlash within the community, particularly in Fiji, because the whole time, the media was also uh, covering the, 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 the case, my situation. In that one whole year, I was also uh, forced not to attend school. So I, my, my right to education was compromised within that one year, and, uh, but I passed my exam when I finally uh, allowed by the Ministry of Education to sit for my exam in an interior where I had to travel 25 kilometers inland just to sit for my paper. So that experience was traumatizing, but also kind of sparked an energy and a passion that I wanted to continue the work within the movement because the situation in my country was so bad. I grew up in a generation where I experienced four military coups in the Pacific. That's why when we talk about backlash, it is important that we frame the context within increasing militarization within the region. We've seen over the years how military spending and military budget has increased in the Asia Pacific as well as in the world. We have millions and trillions of dollars injected into military spending. But also, apart from that, military presence within our political spaces has led to the introduction of draconian laws. So in Fiji, we have two military coups in 1987, one in 2000, and the recent one in 2006. The military government that took power in 2006 is still running now. They got elected into government in 2014 when we had the national elections. So when they came into power, they had introduced um, certain uh, draconian laws, which made it very difficult for civil societies and activists like myself, LGBT activists, to kind of navigate around the political spaces, but really calling for you know democratization of our country and so forth. What they introduced, one law in particular, was the Public Emergency Regulation Act which made it very difficult for any civil society groups or activists to convene meetings, workshops, or just to organize around our issue. So every time we had to meet as uh, a movement, as uh, an organization, we always have to apply for a permit. We have to ask for permission to speak, to convene, to be heard, and that's within this military regime but we had to operate and we continue to operate within that. The second draconian law that they introduced was the registration They made it very difficult for civil society organizations in my country to get legal registration. Some of these um, uh, civil societies will even be registered from the Fiji Register Gentles Act. And to date, we are still finding very complicated as a movement, as a young feminist transgender movement in my country to legally register because 
of the, the laws that have been introduced by this military government. The other uh, scenario that happened following the military coup, we had a lot of activists that spoke out. A lot of pro-democracy activists that speak out against the government, human rights defenders, <coughs> and they were taken into the military barracks and they were tortured. Mm -hmm. They were tortured by the military regime. This is under the Baini Marama government, who is still our prime minister at the moment. He tortured civilians, he tortured through police brutality, he started infiltrating all of the state institutions with all of his officers from the military, and then he started uh, cracking up on um, activists, human rights defenders that were taken up into the military. The other scenario that we had to operate was the silencing of our media, as well as the prisoning of political dissent. To date, we still have uh, prisoners who you know, spoke out against the military regime takeover of our elected government, <coughs> who are now serving time in prison, who are unionists, who are human rights defenders. And this is the situation that we continue to grow up in the Pacific. The other uh, sort of scenario I wanted to quickly pick out is the conversation that we had earlier yesterday with the independent experts on um, Asoji when he mentioned that one of the thematic papers was looking specifically into the area of decolonization. Mm -hmm. And in the specific, we've had a lot of our Pacific Islanders who still have, who are former colonies, and who still have criminalization laws and colonial era laws that criminalize our bodies, <coughs> that criminalize us for being ourselves. So the conversation about decolonization is as important about the conversation about addressing religious fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Because when colonization came into our region, it took away our mana, our spirit, our ancestors, our way of worshiping, and introduced white religion that were criminalized and today still dictate a lot of the work that was going within the Pacific. So I think it is very important to always, you know, center conversations around decolonization, but also linking into religious fundamentalism, the rising of religious fundamentalism, including ethno-nationalism in the Pacific and other regions of the world. And with that, I recognize the presence of my sister, uh, Shant Kumar, who also traveled from Fiji. Shant's ancestors came into uh, Yeshan. She came, they came into, uh, they traveled, they migrated to Fiji through the indentured labor, which was introduced by the British. So conversations around decolonization might also take into account the unique experience of the Indo-Fijian diaspora in Fiji. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about indigenous rights and where there are diaspora that exist, it must also find place in the discourse. And that is something that we've been, you know, sort of prioritizing in our movement. As House of Chameleons, we want to make sure that the voices of our diaspora community of Indo-Fijians are to be correct in our 2013 constitution. Fijians of Indian descent is paramount as well. And when we talk about indigenous rights, and that's something that we, uh, you know, <coughs> are pledged to take forward. And of course, ooh, <laughs> There's a lot I wanted to talk about in terms of the experience, but uh, quickly, just moving on, we, we are one of the countries in the world that has constitutional protection for LGBT people. In 1997, Fiji became the second country in the world, second to South Africa, to have explicitly sexual orientation as a prohibited ground of discrimination in its constitution under the Bill of Rights. In 2012, we had a constitutional review under the military government, and then we made submission to include and extend that prohibited ground of um, protection to include gender identity and expression. So the now 2013 Constitution, under the Bill of Rights, has sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression as prohibited grounds of discrimination under the Bill of Rights. But there's a limitation when we talk about the militarization of our political spaces. The limitation is, despite constitutional protection of LGBT people under our Bill of Rights, you cannot marry as an LGBT person, you cannot adopt, you cannot inherit the 
property of your partner and you cannot get legal gender recognition. Mm -hmm. In 2015, we had a transgender woman who applied for legal gender recognition in our Fiji's High Court. And that was unfortunately dismissed. And this is something that we need to take into account when we talk about despite progress that seems so, you know, uh, pretty, there is still a lot of work. Recently, we became a newest member of the Human Rights Council. In fact, we chair the Human Rights Council, uh, vice chair, through our permanent mission in Geneva and also a few countries in the world. So, yeah, just a situation of Fiji before I move into the specific back question. Yeah.